Hello, and welcome to this presentation on postpartum care. My name is Dr. Kimberly Cheatham. The objectives for this presentation are listed here. Postpartum management begins while the patient is still in the hospital. Self and infant care should be reviewed with the patient as well as other important postpartum instructions before the patient is discharged to home. Care of the perineum for women who have had a vaginal birth is outlined here. Here are more postpartum instructions for the patient. More information is listed here. Traditionally, the postpartum period is considered to last six weeks after delivery. During this time, the physiologic changes of pregnancy return to the pre-pregnancy state. Breastfeeding is established, and patients recover for a return to work or for resuming their routine household and child care activities. It is important for the clinician to understand that some conditions, such as thyroid dysfunction and postpartum mood disorders, have an increased incidence for a full year after delivery. Involution is the term used to describe the change in uterine size back to a pre-pregnancy state after delivery. Immediately after delivery, uterine bleeding is controlled by uterine contractions compressing the exposed vessels from the area of placental separation. The uterus continues to contract during the process of involution. In addition, during the postpartum period, women normally have a vaginal discharge that begins as red bleeding, referred to as lochia rubra. After about a week, the discharge changes to a white-yellow color, termed lochia alba, that can last up to about five weeks. The return to ovulation depends on whether the mom participates in breastfeeding. Women who are not lactating can ovulate as soon as four weeks after delivery, and menses usually begin around eight weeks postpartum. Women who breastfeed their infants exclusively begin to ovulate and menstruate much later, around six months after delivery. A significant amount of pregnancy weight is lost in the first two weeks after delivery. The remainder of pregnancy weight is lost over the next six months. Hair loss should be expected for several months after delivery. Urinary, fecal, and flatal incontinence are also common after delivery, but almost always resolve within six months. Kegel exercises are recommended to strengthen the pelvic floor and improve control of bowel and bladder function. Thyroid dysfunction is relatively common in the postpartum period. Patients with symptoms of severe mood swings, anxiety, or excessive fatigue should have a TSH check to rule out a thyroid disorder. Patients with pre-existing thyroid disease should also have a TSH level checked six weeks postpartum to ensure that their thyroid medication is at the correct dose. Some degree of mood swings occurs in most women after nine months of pregnancy and delivery of the baby. Postpartum mood disorders are categorized on this slide. Most commonly, women will suffer from postpartum blues, which results in unpredictable tearfulness, fatigue, and irritability. Mom should still be performing most of her routine activities and is able to care for the newborn. This condition occurs in the first two weeks after delivery and should not last longer than two weeks. No therapy is required because spontaneous resolution of symptoms is the norm. Postpartum depression is a more severe mood disorder occurring in more than 10% of postpartum women. Symptoms include irritability, labile mood, anxiety, depressed affect, and difficulty sleeping. Mom may not be performing her usual daily activities and may not be able to care for the baby. Postpartum depression can occur at any point in the first year after delivery and usually lasts for months if appropriate treatment is not initiated. Therapy is indicated with antidepressant medication and or psychotherapy. Much less common is postpartum psychosis, which occurs in less than 1% of postpartum women. Symptoms begin within days of delivery and include confusion, clouded sensorium, and psychotic episodes. Mom is a potential danger to herself and her baby. Thus, immediate evaluation and therapy are indicated. 
Treatment is with antipsychotic medication, antidepressants, and psychiatric management. Vaginal bleeding is normal for up to eight weeks postpartum. However, heavy, persistent bleeding can indicate pathology. The most common causes of excessive bleeding during the first six weeks after hospital discharge are retained placental tissue in the uterus or a bleeding diathesis such as von Willebrand's disease. Evaluation of the uterine lining by pelvic ultrasound can identify any retained placental tissue. The transvaginal ultrasound images on this slide demonstrate a thin endometrial stripe on the top image which rules out a retained placenta and a thickened stripe on the bottom image which supports the diagnosis of retained placental tissue. Another common complication that occurs after delivery is postpartum endometritis. This condition is an infection of the uterine lining that can occur after vaginal or cesarean delivery and is the most likely cause of a fever in the postpartum period. Postpartum endometritis is caused by a variety of bacteria that arise from the vagina and are transmitted to the upper genital tract through cervical exams and labor or with delivery during a cesarean section. The differential diagnosis for postpartum fever is listed on this slide. Risk factors for postpartum endometritis are listed here. Infection commonly occurs after a cesarean section. Because of this increased infection rate, patients undergoing a C-section are routinely given prophylactic antibiotics during the surgery to minimize the chance for infection. The clinical presentation of a patient with postpartum endometritis includes the findings listed on this slide. The signs most commonly seen are fever and uterine tenderness. Postpartum fever is endometritis until proven otherwise. Treatment of postpartum endometritis is straightforward. However, endometritis should not be taken lightly. If it's not treated sufficiently or in a timely manner, it can progress to a more serious pelvic infection. Broad-spectrum intravenous antibiotics should be administered until the patient is afebrile with resolution of the uterine tenderness for over 24 hours. Once the patient has met these criteria, antibiotics can be stopped and the patient can be discharged home with routine follow-up. Mastitis is an infection of the breast tissue that occurs most frequently at the time of breastfeeding, usually within three months from delivery of the baby. This infection causes pain, swelling, redness, warmth of the breast, and often fever. It occurs when bacteria, usually from the baby's mouth, enter a milk duct through a crack in the nipple. The bacteria cause an infection and painful inflammation of the breast. Sometimes an abscess can complicate mastitis. An abscess presents as a painful, fluctuant mass palpated in the area of the breast affected by mastitis. Patients who complain of symptoms consistent with mastitis should be evaluated immediately. Diagnosis is by physical examination. A delay in diagnosis can lead to worsening infection and development of a breast abscess. Treatment of uncomplicated mastitis is accomplished as an outpatient with oral antibiotics for 10 days that are effective against the most common causative bacteria, Staphylococcus and Streptococcus. If an abscess is present, treatment includes admission to the hospital with intravenous antibiotics and a surgical consult. The patient will require incision and drainage of the abscess. Because the bacteria that cause mastitis usually arise from the baby's mouth, women with mastitis who are breastfeeding are encouraged to continue nursing both breasts. The baby will not be infected and regular emptying of the involved breasts will assist in recovery. This concludes this presentation on postpartum care.